We have a wonderful message today on the rapture, and um, I just so enjoyed singing the solid rock today in preparation for that message. That is one of my favorite hymns of all time. So thank you for joining me in singing that today. And let's go ahead and welcome Pastor John as he prepares to share the word with us today. I have a magnetic personality who shocked each other. <laughs> What's going on in the world today? Hey, what is it? <laughs> we have a lot of soothsayers, prognosticators, astrologers, a lot of so-called prophets, but they're not really prophetic, they're pathetic. <laughs> and what's the world coming to? Well, it's coming to Jesus. And I've stopped looking for signs, and I've started listening for the shout. It's coming soon. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, and incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? So the sting of death is sin, for the strength of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 4. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Our outline today is the promise, the pattern, the process, the purpose, the prophetic profile, the prophetic problems. Now you know it's got to be right because there's all these P's in there and everything starts with a P. You learn that from your good Baptist brothers that if you got all the same letters starting the outline, it's going to be a good one. We have this promise in Titus chapter 2, verse 13. And if you're going to uh, get involved in uh, Bible studies and prepare yourself for a license possibly to be a minister, they're going to ask you, what's the blessed hope and where can you find it? Well, it's right here. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I like this verse because it takes us to a position where you can't repeat this without thinking Jesus is our great God. Amen. Amen. He is God. That's right. He is the Son of God, That's right. the second person of the Trinity. It is uh, with great thanks that I extend my appreciation to teachers that have taught me 
I go way back to the very early days when there was a young fella by the name of Hobart Castile that was about five foot four, and he had a 28 foot chart. <laughs> and he carried that thing with him wherever he went. And he got me interested in prophecy. And that chart was a, a chart of the end times. I learned a lot from him. And then I picked up from other people. John Wolford, Warren Wearsby, Frank Boyd, and Meyer Perlman with the Assemblies of God. J. Vernon McGee. Who hasn't learned something from J. Vernon McGee? God bless him. Uh, Perry Stone. Jack Hibbs. Gary Hamrick. Uh, Chuck Missler, i got to thank Chuck for a lot of what I'm sharing with you today. I, I have been wanting to do something on uh, the rapture for a long time, and I kept just not getting it, and then I saw that an outline, which was uh, partly the, what we have here, that came from Chuck, and I, boy, it just was encouraging, and I jumped right in it. And it just all flowed. It was time. God wanted me to do it now, and you get to reap the benefits of me trying to do something for several years. This is a good one. And I'm excited to hear what it has to say. <laughs> it, this is the most preposterous doctrine of all doctrines of evangelical Christianity. The instantaneous removal of believers from earth. Poof, they're gone. Nothing like that has ever taken place in the history of the world. One or two, yeah, well, that was just uh, hearsay. But millions, nothing like that's ever happened. It's going to. Yes. It's going to happen just the way God said it would. Several pastors, teachers, and church doctrines view this removal as being imminent or at any moment. Often repeated is the statement that there are no signs or prophecies that need to be fulfilled before the rapture. I've said that myself a number of times. But lately I have come to understand and believe that there is one sign that has always been there that we haven't paid attention to that must take place before the rapture of the church. It is apostasy. And it's found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. He says there, let no one deceive you. Now that's a biggie. Don't be deceived. And we're going to talk more about that. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, referring to the second, the uh, rapture, excuse me, that day, the tribulation, okay, will not come unless a falling away comes first. That word falling away is the word apostasy. And the man of sin is revealed. That is the Antichrist. So the apostasy must happen. Then the uh, uh, revelation of the Antichrist must happen. Then the tribulation can start. The man of sin, sin being revealed is the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, <coughs> that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That is a contradiction in terms and statements. He's talking out of both sides of his mouth at the same time. We're going to find out why Paul says this. Now notice it takes two scriptures for us to get this picture. It is text taken out of context produces pretext or error. Always look at the context of a verse and then examine the verse after you get the full meaning. Okay, So the full meaning that we have, falling away, that day, and the man of sin that we want to identify. The falling away is the word apostasia in the Greek. In English, it's the word apostasy. And Paul says, do not be deceived. This is the single biggest sign of end times is deception. Satan is a deceiver. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 5, many will be deceived. There is a deception both in and out of the church. Thus Jude says to us, contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. We have a set of doctrines. Let's uphold all the doctrines, not just the ones we prefer the most. That day is the seven-year tribulation period when God sends His wrath. It's His wrath in the form of four different groups of seven Judgments. How many of you have heard of the three? Three sets of seven, right? Uh, the seals. 
trumpets and the bowls, right? right. What's number four? That's always skipped. Most people don't notice it. First is the seals, which Jesus breaks. Then the trumpets follow on the seals. And then there are seven thunders. John is, is uh, given the vision of a mighty, tall, strong angel who has one foot on the sea and one foot on land. And he raises up his hand and proclaims to the Lord God Almighty that everything shall be accomplished that has been said. But, and it takes us to that verse that comes out of Numbers. God is not a man to lie, neither is he the son of man to repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do? Hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Everything is going to come to pass exactly the way he has said. Then there are seven thunders that follow the voice of that angel. And it says, John was about to write them down, and a voice said to him, Do not write them down. So he doesn't. Those seven thunders are in league with the other seven. Seals, trumpets, and then the seven bowls. But before the bowls, there must be these seven thunders. Total mystery. Three, falling away, that, that day being the tribulation, and then the man of sin, the Antichrist, the son of perdition. That word perdition is the word pernicious, which means destroyer. It's one of the names that are given to Satan. He will deceive the world into believing that there is no God. Then he will proclaim himself to be God. It is something easy for us to talk about and say. We can go through these lists of things and say, yeah, John, I get it. But you know what? You really don't get it until you see it. What's going on now in the Middle East, you can see. Yes. I mean, they've got the, the video cameras of the guys out there right there doing it. I mean, we have this now when a policeman is doing his thing. They got these, what do they call them, GoPro cameras on them, and you can see them doing what they need to do. Arrest somebody, take, put somebody uh, that's been speeding too fast, you have it on film. And once it's on YouTube, it's, <laughs> it's forever. Whatever. You know, they say whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <clears throat> once it gets on YouTube, it's there forever. You know? And uh, I was talking with my daughter. She... Uh, was, was mentioning about this neighbor that she'd been having problems with. I did too. Uh, one night when I dropped our granddaughter off after Bible study at Viola's house, these four pit bull dogs came out to attack her. I went out there and I got between her and the dogs and I said, go get your mom. She came out with a stick and they, I mean, they were just inches away from growling and I was swinging and kicking and trying to keep them away and, and I, wanted, I wanted to get them, but I didn't have any weapon. If I had a weapon, woohoo, I would have had some fun. But and they were... <laughs> I was out there for I mean 15 minutes fighting off these dogs. Oh my goodness. Okay, so that th that person moved that had the dogs. I was talking with her. It says they're only supposed to have two dogs. They had eight. Oh. They had eight dogs, and they were doing some other stuff. But she said when they left, they took all the appliances, all the furniture. They took a ball of and they put punched holes in the walls. That she was talking to the person that rented out the house. He says. Just to fix the bathroom, it's going to cost me over $2,000. Oh. And he says, I got the rest of the house that I have to fix, plus put utilities back in. Uh -huh. And so uh, that's destructive. Yes. Yes. You see? Yes. And this character here is destructive. What it says of Satan, he has come to rob, kill, and destroy. Yes. Destroyer. And that is one of the names of the Antichrist. A destroyer. So what is our pattern? Let's take a look at one of the best indications of a pre-tribulation rapture is the Jewish wedding. Jesus said in John chapter 14 verses 1 through 3, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there, you, you, maybe also. Did you catch that? I was really, really trying to push that. You see what it's about? Yes. It's about you. Yes. It's about you. Hallelujah. The, the whole statement that the Lord Jesus Christ is you because he loves you. Amen. And he's preparing a place for you. Amen. Now, well, among the things that takes place in the, is the ketubah, which is a betrothal. It's actually the payment that's made 
the price that is paid to gain the young girl, the bride. It's the first step of her now becoming his wife. As soon as that action takes place, and that as soon as that payment is made, hey, in the Jewish custom, they're married. And this is what happened with Joseph and Mary. You remember that he was going to put her away quietly? Okay. He had paid the price, but they had not come together as a husband and wife normally does. Okay? But they were married. So he was just going to put, and then the angel Gabriel came and says, no, 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 don't put her away. Take her, because the baby that she's carrying is from God. So that was, that was the payment purchase. What do we have? Jesus has paid the price for you and me. Peter says, he didn't buy us with silver and gold, but he bought us with his precious blood. Amen. Amen. The bridegroom departs. He goes to his father's house, and he prepares a home for him and his wife. He's out there, Mr. Carpenter, and makes a whole lot of good sense. Jesus is a carpenter. He's built a place for us. Isn't it great? Okay. You know, now, the, the, all that makes sense because when, when we get through reading this, then Jesus says, where I go, you know, and the, and the way you know. And it's Thomas that said, what are you talking about? What, what, what do you mean? We don't know the way and we don't know what you, what, where you're going. And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You see, if it hadn't been for Dowling Thomas asking that question, we wouldn't have that verse. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So he is, he is building a place for his wife. Now, this reminds me so much of our son. When uh, the, the, the situation when, when Christy, uh, her family were in Texas. And her dad had taken up the position of choir leader, drama leader, orchestra leader. He had this position as being a minister of music, and he did it all. And they were in Texas at a church there, and Ken was still here with us. Long distance relationship. They were talking to one another, writing bit, and they surprised each other by flying out, you know. And this went on for several months. It was just as beautiful a thing as can be. All the time that this is going on, Ken's been filling up our garage with their furniture. <laughs> He's been buying stuff, getting ready for their uh, time when they would have a place to move into. And by the time it was ready for the, the wedding was going to take place in a couple weeks, he found an apartment. We moved all the stuff in. It was ready the minute she walked in the door. It was a done deal. And that's what Jesus is doing for you and me right now. When we get there, it's going to be just like you want. It's going to be exactly what you're looking for. I've already put in orders. I want an elk chandelier over my dining room table. Because <laughs> Della won't let me have one. So if I get to heaven, I want one. <laughs> Y'all come see my chandelier when we get to heaven. <laughs> Is there going to be a surprise gathering that's unannounced? He shows up without a warning. She's been all the time keeping herself ready, preparing herself daily. Any moment, her lover is coming to claim her. And he shows up and he brings with him the canopy. It's called a hoopa. It's a covering. And they take the two of them and they have this canopy over the top of them and they go to the house and they're celebrating. Here comes the happy couple. Then they have a marriage supper and a celebration that lasts seven days. Boy, dad better have a lot of stuff on hand because it's going to be a, a good party, right? Yes. And this was the first miracle of Jesus, was it not? Yes. They ran out of the liquid refreshments and he made it ready. Yes. I love what a minister one time said. The, the water saw its creator and blushed. Oh, that's cute. Wasn't that beautiful? Uh -huh. It turned to wine. The marriage fulfilled... There is a covenant established that we have in 1 Corinthians concerning a covenant with our Lord. It's in the blood. This is my covenant with you. Here's the cup. Here's the bread. Take it. Receive it. The purchase price, his blood. The bride is set apart. Set apart means hagios, holy, means saint. And it's a reminder of the covenants of the past. And the bridegroom left for the father's house to prepare the place for his bride and returns, which we read in John 14. And an escort accompanies him upon his return to gather his bride. And if you read the story in Matthew 
uh, 25, that the bridegroom comes at midnight and there is a crowd with him. And they, they all are celebrating the process. So we have the promise of his coming, the blessed hope. We have the pattern, which is similar to the Jewish wedding. And then we have the process of being transfigured that I've read to you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout and the, uh, the trump of God and the dead will Christ will rise first and we which are alive and remain be caught up. That is the word harpazo, which is the net title of the lesson today. The rapture, the harpazo, means to be snatched up out of, the, out of harm's way and to be caught up into the clouds, into the air. Now, I've, uh, have you ever noticed that in 1 Corinthians, Paul the Apostle says that Satan is the prince of the power of the yeah. air? So, in, in my humble opinion, just, just this is Johnny, Mr. Uh, science major in, 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 cool, in school, okay? I believe that it's right up to the ozone, because the prince of the power of the air is that out there. The atmosphere of the earth is the air, which is his domain. So Jesus comes almost to uh, the domain of the enemy, but above it. And then he calls us up. So when we, we leave this earth and we go up past the ozone into the domain of God, out of the domain of Satan, we're just marching right through Satan's living room. And this would be your opportunity to thumb your nose at him as you go, you know, as you go neener, neener, as you're flying up. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be really quick. I hope it's slow so I can do a neener neener on the way. <laughs> uh, we're, we're going to be caught up into the air. Amen. And, uh, 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 in uh, the passage in uh, Corinthians that we read, we were caught up into the clouds. Uh, my daughter used to say, she would, every time it was cloudy, she said, oh, Jesus is coming. It's a cloudy day. <laughs> I said, well, could be, honey. <laughs> caught up, harpazo, snatch away, remove out of harm's way. Uh, the Latin Vulgate, uh, translation from uh, St. Jerome in about 370 A.D. He translated that Greek word harpazo into repirir. And I don't say that correctly. So those of you who know Latin or maybe you've been to a Catholic church and you've learned it. Rapirir, R-A-P-I-E-M-U-R. Okay, that's the Latin word for harpazo. It is. It comes from rape, which is the root word. And it means rapture. It means rapture. That's where we get the term, the rapture of the saints. It comes from the Latin word, which is the Greek tr uh, translation of the Greek word harpazo. Uh, have you ever seen a young man get smitten by a girl? It's real pretty. And he just, his brain turns to jello and his mouth goes, bleh, 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 you know, uh, this, this young fella is enraptured. Okay, he's caught up. And he's in another world now. And we will be too. When we're raptured, we're going to be in another world. There are eight raptures that are easily found in Scripture. Uh, one is Enoch. You're familiar with that. Yes. He, he walked with God and then was not. God says, you know what? It's closer to my house than it is yours. You might as well come over here. Uh, and uh, Elijah uh, was caught up with the fiery uh, the, the chariot. And then uh, Jesus in the book of Mark is, is caught up. Uh, and Philip in Acts chapter 8, he was translated from the Ethiopian eunuch. And then Paul in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about a man was caught up into the third heaven. A lot of folks think that was really Paul. And then the church in 1 Thessalonians 4, that's us. We'll be caught up. And then in John, St. John in chapter 4, verse 1, he looks up to heaven. He sees a door open and, and a voice says, come up hither. I think that's what Jesus is going to say when, when the rapture comes. And that great voice, that great, and he's going to say your name and my name all at the same time. Okay? Now, he has that ability because guess what? He's God. He can do whatever he wants to do. <laughs> and then he's going to say, come up hither. And I'm going to say, mm -hmm. yes, sir. <laughs> I am ready. Yes, sir. Yeah. And then there was a secret rapture. This one's the most people don't notice this one. It's when in Matthew chapter 27, verses 52 and 53, it says at the resurrection, that Old Testament saints came up out of their graves, which is really interesting. And they were walking through the streets of Jerusalem after they had risen from the dead. So, you know, somebody that had passed away a few months ago, they come over and said, Hey, Grandpa's here. What? <laughs> we just buried him last month. No, he's right there he is. And Jesus, at this same particular time, was talking to Mary Magdalene. And in Jesus, in this particular instance, in chapter 20, verse 17, 
he says to Mary, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended. You see that? To my father, but to go to my brethren and tell them, I am going to ascend to the father. So he says it twice. Okay? And then in the uh, same day, he comes to see his um, his disciples just two verses after that statement. In John 20, verse 17, talking to Mary Magdalene. In verse 19, the same day, he shows up and he sees the disciples. When the doors were shut for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood and said to them, Peace be with you. Shalom. Jesus walked in and said, Shalom. And they said, Ha ha ha. Then Jesus showed them his hands and his side. And it says they were glad. Uh, I bet they were glad. I'd be jumping out of my skin. It's him. He's really here. He is. Well, somebody wasn't there. Thomas. Thomas wasn't there. And when they said, hey, Jesus is risen, he said, ha, ha, ha. I saw those nails. I saw that spear. I said, no, 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 no. Unless I can put my finger in the hand, my hand in the side. I'm not going to believe. Well, eight days later, Jesus showed up and he submitted to the test. He said, Thomas, come on over here. I love you to pieces. Here's my hands. Here's my side. Be satisfied. And, and bless you because you believe. But more blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Uh -huh. And Peter talks about that. He says it, should, it was just unbelievable to, unbelievable to him. Whom having not seen you love. And that is our condition, is it not? We can't help but just love our Jesus with all of our hearts. Because he has so loved us. So that's, that's the... Uh, uh, the three things that we have, that's the process. Now we have a purpose. The purpose of the rapture is to remove us from the coming evil and change our earthly corrupt temporal bodies into new incorruptible eternal bodies. What we read in 1 Corinthians 15. In a moment in the twinkling of an eye. The word moment is the word in Greek atomos. It is something that the Greeks said there is something so small it cannot be divided into two. You can't make two out of it. And that something is atomos. And it's the word that's been borrowed to use for an atom. An atom cannot be divided into two atoms. You divide an atom, it blows apart. A la the A-bomb. When you divide an atom, it can't make two. You know, I, I, I don't know if I said it in here or not, but I will say it again because I think it's funny. It is, you know, again, science. I just, it's just I love this. What, what's water made of? What's, what's it often called? Huh? H2O. H2O. You know that you can get two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom, and you can put them, and, and you can have them right there in the laboratory. You can't make water. You can't make it. God makes it. That's right. God's able to turn those two gases into something that is liquid and you can warm it up and put your tea in there and you're a happy guy. <laughs> or you can steam it and be in a sauna and sweat all that nasty stuff out of you. Or you can get it really nice and hard and put it in your iced tea and that makes your day. Makes Della's day. <laughs> she likes half a glass of ice and the rest of it's tea. And I said, you only got two sips of tea there. The rest of it's all ice. Well, that's the way I like it. Uh, and I, okay, honey. Yeah. Uh, huh? And George, your wife, you guys can check us out next time you see us. You watch Della fill her glass up. <laughs> it's an atomic second, in my humble opinion, which is something that you cannot see. I can I can I just be silly and picture this with you? Walking from one spot to another spot. You don't even stop to think about how your foot lifts up off the ground and then you put it down. In less time than it takes you to pick up your foot and put it down in front of you, your whole body changes into an immortal body. Wow. You lift your foot, you're what you are now, you put your foot down, and you are tall, dark, and handsome. <laughs> oh, look out! Hollywood, you think you got good looking guys? Looky over here. You know? Lots of nice pretty hair too. Amen. If I don't get nice pretty hair like George has got, I'm coming back. <laughs> Atomic second. 
when and who goes the imminent return of Jesus. Believers are taught to expect the Savior from heaven at any moment. We find several scriptures that are telling us. Titus tells us that it is, this is our blessed hope. It expresses a hope of excitement and spirit of expectancy from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. We should re, it should result in a desire for a purified life and a passion for lost souls. 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. The idea of us becoming children of God, and it, it is one of the things I am so fascinated in watching when somebody becomes a Christian quickly, they want to reach out to others and love them. And they want to reach out to their lost loved ones and introduce them to Jesus. There's a desire in your heart to be with saints and to be in the church and read your Bible. And there's a desire for those that don't know this experience to have it. That is one of the things I believe what really got a hold of a lot of the early Christians from the 1800s and the 1900s into the missionary movement of the mid-1900s was this passion that Jesus could come back at any second. We need to get the word out around the world that people will be ready for the return of Christ Jesus. It is that that is put in our hearts. There is a yearning to those who are eagerly waiting for him and for those, it says in Hebrews 9, 28, if you are eagerly waiting for him, he's coming for you. This doctrine of imminency, Paul included himself among those. He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17 that I read, we which are alive and remain. You notice he thought in the day before his martyrdom by Nero in the mid-60s AD, he thought that Jesus could come back in that day. This is exactly, honestly, what the disciples were thinking. They said, are you going to set up the kingdom now? And he says, it's not for you to know the times of the seasons. And they thought, well, he's the, he's the son of David. He's the son of God. He's the future king. And he's going up. Well, the, the, the Old Testament tells us he's going to come back. Like, and even those guys told us, the guys that were standing there, says he's going up. He's going to come back the way he is. Oh, good. Let's see. Let's see. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm um, ready for him to come back and set up his kingdom. He said, no, no, no. He told you to go into Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. So we've been waiting. Yeah. And it's getting closer. It's getting much closer than it ever has before. Timothy was admonished. Keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be ready. Our royal rangers of the assemblies of God, that's their motto. Ready. Converts are reminded... And yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and he will not tarry. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37. The exhortations that we have received from him in Luke chapter 19, verse 13, Jesus said, Occupy till I come. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 13, at the summary of the story of the five wise and five foolish virgins, he gives them the, the reason why I'm telling you this story is verse 13. Watch and pray watch and pray the two doctrinal extremes that we have today are preoccupied uh, with a daily life like the days of noah and the days of lot people were marrying giving in marriage buying and selling and planting and building and seeking secular pleasures and life and ignoring the spiritual life and even those of us in the church i find us so often getting caught up in what's going on in the world that we fail to recognize the spiritual aspect of what's happening right in front of us. And number two, so there is this anticipation where we're just too busy to think about it. And then the other one is thinking that, well, if, if it can happen any minute, I might as well just sit home in my lazy boy chair and wait. You know, there's no use doing this. And then the guy says, well, if we go up to the top of this hill, then he's going to come tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Oh, good. Let's all go to the top of the hill. <laughs> And there's been a few of those that didn't work out too good. They were called the date setters. In uh, 1843, it was a guy named William Miller who did that, who said the Lord was coming back October 22nd, 1844. And not so much. Uh, C.T. Russell said it in 1874. And again, uh, E.C. Knotts said there were 88 reasons why Jesus would come back in 1988. I, I wonder if one of those was the, that was the last year that Reagan would be president. I mean, you know, that would have been a good year. <laughs> Ever since then, we've had some losers. 
Um, <laughs> Uh, Harold Camping has, has uh, a few times said it in, in September 15, 1944, he said the Lord was coming back. And then I mean, if you remember the Mayan calendar, that was a big deal around 20, uh, December 12, 2012, uh, the world's going to come to an end. So said that circular calendar. Uh, we're still here. Okay. Now, the only thing we got out of that was a movie called 2012 that made a whole bunch of money for some people in Hollywood. Well, yippee skippy for them, but uh, none of this other stuff happened. So there is the other, the other side. There is one side where we're just, well, let's wait and see. And then there's a side thinking it's going to happen any second. And let's set a date. Both wrong. Rapture scriptures are found throughout the New Testament. John 14, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians. First Timothy, all kinds of allusions to the uh, rapture and the coming of the Lord Jesus. The second coming scriptures are different. Daniel chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 12, Zechariah 14, Matthew 13, Matthew 24. A number of those are referring to the second coming and not to the rapture. These are two separate events that I've given you a chart. On the rapture side, one of the things that happens at the rapture is the translation of the saints. At the second coming, there's no translation of saints. At the rapture, there's tra the translated saints go to heaven. At the second coming, the translated saints return to earth at the second coming. Earth is not judged at the rapture, but it is judged at the second coming. The imminent return has, uh, is signless, but there are an enormous number of signs referring to the second coming of Christ. The whole book of Revelation is filled with signs that it's about to take place. The rapture is really not found in the Old Testament and is predicted, and the second coming is predicted in the, in the Old Testament and will affect men on earth. The rapture is for believers only. The second coming is for everybody, whether they like it or not. And the rapture is going to take place before the wrath of God falls from heaven, but the second coming comes when God is going to put it when Jesus is going to put all God's wrath to rest. The two events, the rapture, there's no reference to Satan. At the second coming, he's bound for a thousand years. Everybody said, Amen. praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> the rapture, he comes for his own. And the second coming, he comes with his own. And the, the rapture, he comes to the air. And the second coming, he comes to earth. In the rapture, he comes to claim his bride. In the second coming, he comes with his bride. In the rapture, only those who are believers see him. But in the second coming, every eye shall see him. The church believers only are the ones who go up. And in the second coming, the Old Testament saints are raised. Will the church go through the tribulation? There's three ideas. They're referred to as pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, and the post-tribulation. There's a fourth one that I won't talk too much about. It's called pre-wrath, which is taking a peculiar verse out of uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, the rapture, interesting. Uh, some deny that the rapture of the church, but most Christians are not divided on if, only on when. We're not really divided that he won't come back. We're divided on when he will come back. Uh, there's charts that show us the tribulation is not for the church. It's for Israel. I find some more scriptural justification for a pre-tribulation rapture than for anything else. The first is that the 70th week that is referred to for the Jews is a clear seven-year covenant with, from God with his people concerning the, a coming world leader in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Secondly, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 21, Then shall be great tribulation as never has been or ever will be again. Thirdly, it's the time for the wrath of the Lamb, which is referenced in Revelation 6. And in Revelation 14, it's referred to as the wrath of God. Those who believe in a pre-wrath rapture talk about chapter 14, verse 10, that it says the wrath of God and that we would miss that. So we go through the tribulation up to chapter 14. Okay, But the problem is, what we just read from Titus, Jesus is also God. And it says in chapter 6 that the wrath of the Lamb has struck the earth in chapter 6, the breaking of the seals. Uh, Perry Stone points this out. He says the first half of the rapture, the tribulation, is the wrath of the Lamb. 
The second half of the tribulation period is the great tribulation, and it's referred to as the wrath of God the Father. That world leader, the Antichrist, cannot be revealed until after the rapture takes place. On your uh, chart, number four, or page four, you can see what is referred to in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. First is the apostasy that I mentioned. There must be a falling away of doctrinal truths. Are we seeing it today? There are a number of denominations that call themselves Christians that are opening themselves up to what I would call a social gospel. Whatever is accepted in society, whatever is being promoted in society, whatever has been declared as acceptable practices and should be brought into all kinds of businesses, it's expected that the church would fall in line and adopt those same hedonistic lifestyles and, and proclaim that they are right, they are acceptable. Forgetting what the Bible says, just put it aside. I like what our new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, said when he was being attacked. Do you believe this and this? He says, I believe the Bible. Read it. Yeah. In the story, that's it. Mic drop. Away he goes. There must be an apostasy. There must be, and I see it. I see a falling away of the doctrines. I see a putting aside of the scriptures. I see people coming to church, and, and it's like a rotary club. Get all warm and fuzzy and toasty, and then we go home. And, and, and cheer for our favorite football team or whoever it is that you want to do. And God is completely left out. That is so much the picture of the Laodicean church. They think they're rich. They needed nothing. And Christ comes to them and says, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you'll open up, I'll come in and be with you. The restrainer then must be removed. Holy Spirit, Bible thumping, devil chasing, Pentecostal, evangelistic Christians around the world that are attacking the work of the enemy in this world are restraining Satan and his demons from taking over. They have to be removed so that Satan can have his day. Otherwise, we're going to keep, keep kicking. We're going to keep yelling. We're going to keep screaming. No, no, that's wrong. It's awful, terrible, terrible, sinful. Get it out. But when you get rid of us, who's going to stop it? That's why we have to be taken out of this world. Yeah. You know, there's a, I probably shouldn't say this, because, but it's the second, third time that the Holy Spirit has told me to say it already. There's a verse in Corinthians that says that there are some whom the Lord takes out of this world so that they won't have to face what's coming to the world. And we had that preached at Della's sister and brother-in-law who died within a couple days of each other. Just, boom, they were gone. Total shock. Just a slap in the face. They're gone. You're kidding. Yeah. And we went to the funeral and their pastor quoted that scripture. Sometimes God takes an individual out of this world so they don't have to face the evil that's coming to it. But for those of us that are here, he gives us strength. He gives us the power to endure and to lift up the bloodstained banner of Christ. So he was being merciful to them for one reason or another. I don't know why, but he's in charge. That's why it's referred to something that we hardly ever hear preached anymore. God is sovereign. It's one of the first things you learn when you get into the military it's not there for you. <laughs> that base and the barracks and the concession stand and, 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 and the food court is not there for you. Yes. You're there for them. That's right. You're there for the duration. It used to be in World War II. I don't know how many of you remember those that served in World War II. It was for the duration plus six months. That's how long their military service was. Okay? So when you get into the military, you soon find out there's a boss. And you learn how to obey everybody that's above whatever you are. If you look at your sleeve and there's nothing there, everybody's your boss. <laughs> God's the boss of all of us. And that's the idea of being sovereign. He decides, he determines, and he chooses. And we've just done a series 
He's our Heavenly Father who loves us. He is Abba Father. Amen. He is our Abba Father. The apostasy of the church. The restrainer forth is re restraining force is removed. And then the Antichrist shows up. And then the day of the Lord takes place, which is the tribulation period. There has to be a period of time between when the Antichrist appears and the tribulation period starts. Because the Antichrist makes a seven-year covenant with the Israelites, gives them permission to build a temple on the Temple Mount so that they can set up their sacrifices and their offerings throughout this period of time that he sets up for seven years. Then in the middle of that seven years, he breaks that covenant, and then he goes into the temple, which we read in 2 Thessalonians, he goes into the temple after declaring there is no God, declares himself to be God in the Holy of Holies. And Jesus was telling the uh, disciples in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination desolation, when you see that happen, when this man goes into the temple and declares himself to be God, don't come down off your roof and pack your Samsonite luggage. Get out of Dodge and get out of Dodge now. And where they end up, we still we believe today, is they end up in Petra. And there they will stay and be safe. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And he who restrains will continue to restrain until he is taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked one be revealed with all manner of deception. I mentioned this before. Let me Forgive me for saying it again. When Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave, and Satan on the cross, he did, and we, we like to say he removed the teeth of the lion. He goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, is, is the scripture concerning Satan. And we believe Jesus has taken his teeth. So he's got false choppers, or none. And he took his claws, so he is a clawless lion. But he still has his voice. He still has his voice. You follow? And what was it that he used to cause Adam and Eve to fall? His voice. What was it that he was doing with Jesus in the wilderness temptation? His voice. His voice. His voice is a voice of deception. Be careful who and what you're listening to. Because we only have one that we're told that we should be. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word of God. That's what we should be listening to. Yes. Okay? The reasons for the tribulation after the rapture. The promise to the church will be kept from the hour of the trial, which is found in Revelation 3.10. The church is not the object of God's wrath. In Revelation 6.16 6, and 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 9 through 11, we are not appointed unto wrath, unto punishment. But to escape, number three, to endure the tribulation, how? Luke 21, 36 says, pray that you be counted worthy to escape that which is coming on the world. And he says to us, look up, not out. Don't look around, look up, for our redemption draws nigh. Luke 21, 28. Before a war, the ambassadors are called home. 2 Corinthians 5, 20. And we are called, in that verse, Christ's ambassadors. When a country goes to war, the first thing they do is call home their ambassadors. Thank you. And you are them. <laughs> and we're going to go home before God declares war on this world. The restrainer must be removed before the Antichrist can appear. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 3. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, not an extended activity. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. We will be caught up into the air. Not on earth, but above Satan's domain. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. The woman in Revelation chapter 12, verse 5, is Israel, not the church. The analogy is those of Joseph's dream from Genesis 37. The marriage of the bride in heaven includes the, those that are raptured at the second coming. Revelation 19, 11. Revelation 4, 4, we find that the elders are around the thrones. 12 from the Old Testament and 12 from the New Testament. 24 elders sitting on their thrones with their crowns at the very beginning of chapter 4. That tells me that these saints have received their eternal reward in heaven. Okay? 
They're sitting on their thrones with their crowns. That tells me that it's over. We don't receive our eternal rewards down here. We receive them in heaven. The great judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat, is to hand out rewards. And John is there seeing those that have received those rewards. The descendants of Abraham and the saints of the church. The church, the Gentiles, and the Jews are, are put together in one body. And third, then there we have tribulation saints. But all of these individuals who have been raptured and caught up, it's before Jesus gets the scroll. Before he takes the scroll, these 24 elders are on their thrones. That means we're in heaven. Be when he gets that scroll, chapter 6, he begins to open it, and that starts the tribulation period. So chapter 4, verse 1, John's caught up to heaven. That's the rapture. Chap chapter 4 ends with a glory and praise to God who has created all things and for his pleasure they are and were created. Chapter 5 is Jesus and John sees, Jesus sees the scroll in God's hand that nobody is allowed to open but Jesus takes it from God and in chapter 6 he opens it. All of that takes place after you and I are there. Then the tribulation starts. So there's a period of time. There's at least two chapters for Revelation. And down here, there might be a year transpire from the time that the Antichrist collects his kingdom. And then he makes peace with Israel. And as soon as they sign that document, the seven years starts. The rapture of Old Testament patterns. Enoch was raptured before the flood. Isaac was absent. You know, this is a really interesting story. Genesis chapter 22, verse 19, all the way to 24, 62. You know what's not there? Isaac. Chapter 22 is Abraham taking Isaac up to a hill to sacrifice him. Take your son, thine only son, and offer him as a burnt offering to me. Father, where's the burnt sacrifice? God will provide one. He will provide his sacrifice. And then he goes to kill Isaac, and God says, stop. Now I know that you love the Lord and are fearful of him. Over there is a ram. Sacrifice that. From that moment on, the name Isaac does not appear in Scripture until chapter 24, verse 62. You know what that says? His bride shows up. His bride shows up. And then Isaac is mentioned. Jesus has been away. When he comes to get his bride, he shows up again. He's not seen until he's united with his bride. That's a sign of the rapture before the tribulation. Ruth, during the threshing floor scene in, in the book of Ruth, chapter 3, is a picture of how the, the garment of safety and claim of Boaz is placed over her. She now belongs to him. That's a picture of us belonging to our, our husband. Uh, men, this is one time you and you get to learn what it's like to be a bride. <laughs> okay? Our loving husband, our Savior, is coming for us. Daniel's absence from the fiery furnace. You remember this? There's another mention of what the tribulation period. The three Hebrew children go through the fire. They go through it. They're not destroyed by it. They survive. But Daniel's not there. Those that are caught up in the rapture are gone. The second coming, the return of Christ to rule, for 1,845 references in the top of page 5 are in the Old Testament concerning Christ's second coming. 17 books give prominence to the event of his second coming. 318 references in the New Testament. 216 chapters. 23 of 27 books talk about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. For every prophecy of Christ coming the first time, there are eight prophecies of Him coming the second time. He is coming to take over. He is coming to rule this world with a rod of iron. You want to know what that rod of iron looks like? It looks just like this. <laughs> this is the rule. This is going to be the rule book that they're going to follow. And if they don't, He's going to hold back their 
rain, he's going to hold back their produce, they're going to go into droughts and famines. The nations of the world that don't obey and follow and worship the Lord Jesus Christ when he rules in this world are going to be sorry. They'll have to ask for forgiveness. Prophetic problems. Another P. The distinctions between Israel and the church. There are differences. Differences in their origins, differences in their missions, difference in their destinies. The church and Israel are two different groups. They are not the same. The church did not replace Israel. It, the, the church is seeking a heavenly home. We're seeking a marriage supper up in heaven. The Jew, the Israelites, are like Abraham. They are seeking an earthly kingdom. They kept asking Jesus, are you going to set up your kingdom now? I'm going to set up your kingdom now. Oh, by the way, are you going to set up your kingdom now? <laughs> They kept asking him, even when he was getting ready to be ascended into heaven, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, are you going to set up your kingdom? It's not for you to know. The Jewish people are like, like Abraham, who was looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Let me tell you what the name of that city is. New Jerusalem. It's coming down where? Out of heaven. There's not one word about heaven, but there's a whole bunch of stuff about the new city. Gates of Pearl, 12 foundation stones, 12 gates, meet you at the eastern gate. That's for the Jew, not the church. That's for earth, not heaven. Paul said, man is not heard, ear is not heard, neither is it hindered into the heart of man what God has in store for them that love him. That's referring to heaven. And there's not the slightest glimmer of what heaven is going to be like. But we are told what earth is going to be like is going to have a city made out of gold with gold streets. And I like the joke of the guy that was uh, asking God all the time, <laughs> is there golf in heaven? Yeah. You know, they won't play golf. And uh, an angel came up in the middle of the night and said, I got good news and I got bad news. <laughs> well, what's the good news? <laughs> There's golf in heaven. And, well, what's the bad news? <laughs> Your tee off time is 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. You're going. <laughs> And he says, well, wait, 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 just a minute. Let me go get in the, in the closet. So he goes in the closet. He's in there rifling around. He comes out with a brown paper sack. He's like, okay, I'm ready. And the angel's looking at him and says, oh, okay. And, all, and then, poosh, up they go up to heaven. And there's St. Peter at the gate. Hey, welcome. We've been, what do you got in the bag? And what is this all about? And so he goes over. He opens up the bag and pulls it out. And there's a bar of gold. And Peter looks at him and says, why did you bring pavement? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the Jew is looking for a city of streets of gold it's going to be here on earth and God is going to rule them but our eternal home is in heaven it's different the error of replacement theology views the church as having replaced the Jewish people and the nation it denies that Israel has a place in God's program that's not true when God made a covenant with Abraham, he said, split this animal, split this animal, split these birds and do all this stuff. And the, the, uh, the word covenant means to cut. So he divides all these animals and spreads them out. And the process would be, if I could get one of you to come up and join me, I would do this. We would walk together between the animals and the, the commitment would be this, that may happen to me what has happened to these animals if I ever go back on my word of this covenant promise with you. Okay? So if, if I don't want to be sliced and diced <laughs> in tomorrow's in nug McNuggets for something, you know, uh, I will keep my word with you. God did that with Abraham. But Abraham didn't go between the pieces. Only God did. Because he knew Abraham couldn't keep his part of the bargain. But God says, I will keep it. Uh, Perry Stone said he asked a rabbi one time, what does this mean that if God were to break that covenant? He, he said, God would have to destroy his throne in heaven if he ever broke his word with the Israelite nation. Friends, he that protects Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. He's watching what's going on. He's there protecting them and keeping them. The tribulation period is for the Jew, not the church. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. When Daniel was praying because they were in, in uh, 
they, they were captives of the nation of Babylon and they were in Babylon. And Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 10, God said that he would put them into uh, captivity under the Babylonians for 70 years. Daniel in his old age began to see that that 70th year anniversary was coming up. And he began to pray in Ch Daniel chapter 9. God, you said 70 years, make it 70 and let us go home. And the, the, the angel Gabriel came to Daniel and says, it will be exactly as been said, but I have news for you. God is determined to give the nation Israel 77s, 490 years to cleanse the city, to bring punishment and to set things right. For the people, Israelites, the Jews, and for the city, Jerusalem. He wants to put you through this phase of persecution and trouble, 490 years. And then you can come back to the city and be at peace. And your king will rule over you, your Messiah. This was the message that he was giving here in the, the 70 weeks of years. 69 of those weeks... 483 years ended the day that Jesus came in to Jerusalem. On riding on a donkey and coming through the gates, he went up to Mount Olives and he's sitting on Mount Olives in the book of Luke and he's weeping. He said, if you had only known this day, then I could have set you free. But you don't. So you have to endure the final seven years. He cut it off. He put a gap between the... 483rd year and the beginning of the last seven. The beginning of the last seven is the tribulation period. And it will come at his determination and in his perfect will and his perfect time. It will start. And we get that message when he is reading in the book of Luke chapter 4. Jesus opens up the scroll of Isaiah and begins to read. The Holy Spirit has come upon me to preach the gospel to the poor. To set at liberty those that are blind and to set them free that are chained. And to bring peace and the message of the coming of the kingdom. And he closed the book and sat down. He literally, if you read Isaiah chapter 61, he stopped reading at the word and. He closed the book and said, this is fulfilled in your ears. And they were said, well, you didn't finish it. No, he didn't. Because the rest of it says, bringing the judgment and bringing the persecution and bringing the war of God on this earth. That's what he was talking about after the and. And he said, that time is not yet. So Jesus Christ himself set up a gap of time in the 490, year, 490 years, stopping it at 483. You know what's interesting is when Nehemiah received the edict from the king, Ahasuerus, in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 2, the king wondered, how come you're so sad? He says, because my city is burned and the gates are falling down. And he, he says, well, here's a blank check. Go put them back. But let me know how long you're gone because I love you so much. I want to know when you're coming back. And so he said, well, I get done. And he was done in 52 days. That was the thing that Daniel talks about from the day of the going forth to rebuild the city started the 493 years. And if you could count 30 days a month, 360 days a year, to the day that Jesus came through riding on a donkey it's 173,880 days to the day. 483 years based off of a lunar calendar. From the day that Nehemiah got that order to the day that Jesus came in on the donkey. Exactly. 483 years to the day. God puts a lot of restrictions on himself and he proves himself faithful in every single detail. Jesus said, not one jot, not one dotting of an eye, not one tittle, not one crossing of the T will be will fail till all of it is fulfilled. God is God. Hath he said and shall he not do? Hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? He is God. What are we now waiting for? Well, the apostasy of the church. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 10. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. 
I am crying in my heart, knowing some that have departed from the faith. By devoting themselves to deceitful spirits, they have believed a lie in the teachings of demons. Through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, you can't touch them with truth. They don't want to know truth. Revelation 3.16, So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. Luke chapter 21, verse 34, Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen, that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. What's happening? Apostasy in the church and deception in the world. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, the deceiver, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refused to love the truth and be saved. Therefore, therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they would believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure and unrighteousness. We're seeing this every day. We're seeing this every day. Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. So, my friends, the current Middle East crisis, borrowing from Jonathan Kahn, is a harbinger. It's a harbinger. It's a sign. That's what the word means. A sign of the end times. The world must turn its back on Israel. Amir Tessero is a Hebrew brother converted to Christianity who speaks from Galilee at his home on YouTube. And he has said several times in the last daily reports that he gives of what's going on, this is not the war of Psalm 83. This is not Ezekiel 38 and 39. This is not. This is different. He said, in all those cases, the world must turn its back on Israel. But the United States is here. Britain is here. France is here. Norway is here. Others are here. They are with us. They are fighting for us. They are giving us arms. They are giving us supplies. They are giving us uh, the ability to fight for ourselves. But when those other wars come, nobody will be with us. Israel must become a stumbling block to all nations of the world. A worldwide chaos must ensue and demand for some world leader to bring peace. The world is caught up in this mess right now, but the whole world is not like Israel is right now. When the whole world is like what Israel is like right now, then, then now, now you got now you know. The Jews look for a Messiah to deliver them from the terrors and the persecution of the world prior to their complete annihilation or genocide. They're on the verge of being completely wiped out. They're looking for a Messiah who will come. The Muslims seek a Messiah who will come in the midst of chaos and unite the world under Islamic rule. They actually prefer chaos because they know that this will hurry the coming of their Messiah. Christians, neither one. We're looking for a trumpet. We're looking for a voice to shout that will say, come up hither. And as we are caught up, we will enter the gates of heaven, there to be forever with our Lord. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for that. We have hope in Jesus that does not fade or change. You have provided for us a continuous comforter and the eternal promises of your word. You are our strength and our provider. 
You are our ever-present help in the time of trouble. All through life's journey from earth to glory, we have learned to trust in your word. We have learned to depend on you. Help us maintain our attention on the soon return of your son. May, we find, may he find us faithful and yearning for his coming to take us to be with you and all of our loved ones who have already gone before us. Amen. We ask these favors and we give you praise in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 He's coming soon. Amen. God bless you, everybody. We'll see you next week.